It's not based on my health. It's not based on the, the fact that my wife loves me or doesn't love me. It's not based on how well my children are. My faith is not based on those things. It's yours. So we've had moments where we feel like giving up. Like, I, I don't know if I'm going to walk with these people any longer. As a pastor, I felt that way. I'm just like, is this all worth it? Ten years in, January, we've been doing this for ten years, and, and I'm just like, man, people come, and, and they go so easily. They just kind of like, don't even say bye sometimes, and, and I've, I've gone through seasons where people adore me. They're like, Pastor, you're awesome, and then they accuse me. The same people that said, yeah, you're amazing, are the ones that are accusing me, and I've just gone through these moments where I'm like, God, you know, why are they talking about me? What are they saying about me? And I'm worried about whether people like me or not, or stuck in people pleasing. Have you been there? So we live in a society where it's all based on how many people like me? How many people like what I said? How many people like my blogs? How many people like my pictures? How many people are following me? How many people can I influence? We're in a society where it's all just like consumed with this idea that I need people to agree with me, to walk with me. I need people to, to, to tell me that I'm okay. I need their approval. That's the society we live in. But the problem is this. The Bible says for us to not focus on those things in so many different ways but this scripture that I'm about to read is the last scripture that we're studying in this series called blessed are the broken it sounds like a paradox it, it sounds like opposites like you're blessed because you're broken it doesn't make sense blessed means happy it means fortunate uh, to be envied um, and it also it, it, it just that's what God says is good for your life to be blessed according to his viewpoint he says, you're blessed when you're poor in spirit. What is it? Poor spirit? That's broken. It means I need him. Blessed when you're mourn. It means when you truly grieve the condition of sin and how it separated you from God and how it separates you from people and how it brings about death. When you truly mourn that, you're blessed. When you're meek, you're blessed. The Bible t keeps telling us, that when we're merciful, when we forgive, we receive forgiveness. When we have a pure heart, we're blessed. When we, when we have uh, the understanding that we're here not to keep peace, but to make peace. Amen? Which means that it's violent sometimes. That we, you know, peacemakers, they could lose their lives. They could lose their lives. As a matter of fact, several did. Several have. For the sake of your peace. And we're called to be peace makers and, and we're sons of God and I think it's powerful but today's message uh, is never give up and I find this because in so many different ways Jesus is saying you need to know what to expect as you follow me I'm not going to give you false expectations and tell you that everything is going to be wonderful and beautiful and all your problems are going to go away and, and just all of a sudden you're going to come up out of the water after you get baptized and, and, and before you know it, you used to be ugly, now you're pretty. No, <laughs> it's not going to happen that way. If you had issues before you went down, you're going to have issues when you come up. Your marriage is not going to be supernaturally fixed just because you follow Jesus. No, it's going to get better. If you continue to follow Jesus, I believe that you will reflect his heart. And Jesus is the king that we're all looking for. He's humble. He's gentle. He's a servant. He's amazing. He's bold. That's Jesus. And so I believe that as we reflect him, that our relationships will reflect more of heaven. I do believe that. But the, the issue is this. If we don't understand what it means to be a follower, then we can be stuck being a fan from afar off. And I'm a fan, but I'm not a follower. And I think Jesus is amazing. I just don't know him. That's a fan. A fan is I'm not willing to go uh, to war with you. I'll watch. I'll just celebrate the fact that you went. Yeah, I, I, a fan is a, a, someone who sits in the stands and just cheers and wears the, the jersey and, and, and waves a flag or whatever you're waving. And, and the fan is the one who gets mad at the referee, but he's not in the game. The fan is the guy that gets to throw something at the TV and, and just says, oh, we lost. You weren't in the game, brother. But I'm, I'm a fan, too. And so I get mad as if I'm the one that was in the field running and chasing people. That's a fan. A fan says, ah, oh, man, we, we lost again. Okay, so sometimes we treat Christianity that way. All right, let's read this, okay? Because I'm going to be fi I'm fired up, okay? 
I'm fired up. So, so don't try to put me out. I got to still keep burning. So <laughs> Matthew. Matt, and I love it when the clock says zero, 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 zero. That means I'm going to preach for eternity. So, hey, get ready. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wait a minute. Persecuted? What does that mean? That means hunted, pursued? That means harassed? That's what that means. That means someone is trying to kill me. You're blessed because someone's trying to kill you. In America, it's legal to be a Christian. It's legal to come to church, but in some places, it's not. We're, we're, I'm telling you, like we take it so uh, as if it's nothing, the fact that we have freedom to worship our Heavenly Father. Because blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for doing the right thing, for following Jesus Christ. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I love the fact that the, the, the blessed attitudes, the be attitudes start with, blessed are the poor in spirits, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it ends with, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see how it starts with, hey, your blessing is the fact that you're a citizen of heaven. Your blessing is the fact that you are a citizen of heaven. From start to finish, there's something there in that. And we forget that we're not here to make the best of this life. Did y'all catch living my best life? You probably are. If you're living your best life here, chances are you're not going to live your best life there. Did I just say that? Okay, because I didn't have that in my notes. So that was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> my point is this. Jesus said this. You're blessed when people don't like you. For my sake. Not, not just because you're rude. And no, no, no. Don't, don't get it twisted. Dog. Not just because you have a bad attitude. No, no, no. People don't like me. Well, people don't like me. I'm blessed. No, no, no. You used to have a stink attitude. And that's why people don't like you. You're rude. That's why people don't like you. No, no. They didn't like Jesus. And he was perfect. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He expounds on this one more than he does the other beatitudes. More than the other blessed are. He expounds on this one because when you get to this point, this is when you are truly a follower, mature-wise, when he says, okay, now you, you look like me completely. Like you were poor in spirit. Now you have a pure heart. You're a peacemaker. You know how to be merciful. Now you understand that, that you can mourn over the things that you should mourn for. You should hurt for the things that hurt me. And you should love the things that I love. And, I, and now, that, now that you have my heart, now that you're really blessed, I want you to understand this one. Because when you can be persecuted and be rejoiceful and be grateful, then you're truly my disciple. Now you have matured to this point where now, now I, can, I can trust you with the gospel with the kingdom of God on the earth. So the verse 11 says this. It says, it says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. They, told, they said Jesus was, uh, was committing blasphemy, that he was claiming to be the Messiah, which he was, that claiming to be the Son of God. They, they accused him of being a glutton. That means he just ate too much. They said, this guy's a glutton. This guy's a drunkard. He's drinking too much. He's a friend of sinners. They also accused him. They spoke falsely of him, saying, this guy works with the prince or the ruler of demons. He's casting out demons in the name of the demon, the ruler, Beelzebub. And so, so they were accusing him of all these things. They even said that he's opposing Caesar, that he's not letting us pay tribute to Caesar. And, and so they're accusing him. They're saying all these things against him that were false. They were persecuting Jesus. That's what persecution looks like. When someone says that you're something that you're not, and, and they're, they're slandering, they're gossiping about you. Could you, can you be okay with that? Or do you have to fight back? Verse 12. But then he gives us a promise because for every problem, there is a promise. Uh, it says this, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. <laughs> what? They just talked about me at work. I'm supposed to be glad about that? For great is your reward. Not here. We all have rewards here too. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 focus more on heaven 
For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, it's important to really lean in on this. Because if we're going to be persecuted, what does that mean? I just told you it's being hunted. It's being pursued. And, and, and I, I started thinking, I was like, man, what, what has to be in our heart for us to go through difficult times? Like, before I got married, I had an idea how hard marriage was going to be. But I wasn't fully prepared. Anyone else? Like, like I knew that it would be hard and difficult. And, and the reason why it's really hard and difficult is because I'm hard and difficult. Anyone else? Because you got to be selfless. You got to die to self over and over again. And so I, I knew that, okay, we're going to go through some things. But I didn't know that we were really going to go through some things. I thought that I can charm my way into stuff and, and that I could just flirt my way into stuff with my wife. And it didn't work after the first year. No, no, no. The first month. No, no, no. The first week. When having kids, same thing. Man, I knew kid, having kids would be difficult, but I didn't know it was going to be that hard. I was naive. Thank God for, na- for, be, for, for, for being naive in some things. Because if I knew how much it took to be a pastor and to have a church after 10 years, I don't know if I would have done this. I don't know if I would have done this. I'm serious. I don't know. In all those things, God says, like, you're going to be naive. But in this, I don't want you to be naive. Not in this. Not in the fact that you're following. Don't, I, want you, I want you to really know that it's not a walk in the park. It's a walk in the desert with no water. It's a walk in the wilderness. I want you to know it's not a piece of cake. It's, it's a piece of heaven on earth. And the earth is full of brokenness. It's full of hostility. And the earth has a ruler that's blinding people and convincing people to go with the current and basically walk themselves into hell. This is not heaven, y'all. The earth is not heaven. It's been said that for the unbeliever, this is as close to heaven as it'll ever get. But for the believer, this is the close to hell that we'll ever get. Okay, so, so what does it take to really persevere and to move past uh, apathy and all these things? How are we going to just lean into this and really just embrace the fact that we're going to suffer? The only way is through love. We were singing about it earlier. It's the only way. I love this in 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Read this with me, please. Read it out loud. Read it out loud because it tells us right there. I want you to stop right there. Love never gives up. If you're giving up, you're not in love. And I'm not talking about in love like I'm not in love. No, 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 no. You're not in love. That means you're not in Christ. That means you're not in God. Love never gives up. If you feel like giving up, that means that love is no longer in your heart, rooted in your heart. Not my love, not human love. I'm talking about God's love. Because God's love never gives up. It never loses faith. It, it's always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. If this is your foundation, that means that you'll never give up. You'll never Give up through every circumstance. Let me also encourage you with Galatians 6, 9. Because, see, the, the Bible is full of sufferings and, and persecution and people wanting to give up. And, and it's full of people getting tired. But here's what the scripture says in Galatians 6, 9. So, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. That's a that's it. If we don't, give up. So shout with me. Never, never. Give, up. give up. That's right. Don't give up. Keep pressing on. But I want you to know that persecution is a real, is a real thing. It's happening. And Jesus was persecuted. And if we're following him, the Bible says that we will be persecuted. Let's read this in John 15, verse 20. It says, do you remember what I told you? 
A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. He's telling them this. 2 Timothy 3.13 says this. Let's read it out loud, please. Yes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I know this is not a popular message. I know this is not what we want to hear. But this is a mature message. This is what we need to hear. Okay? If you want to live a godly life, you're going to suffer persecution. If you're going to enlist yourself in the army, you may die. If you're going to serve in the military, you have to be all in. If you're going to be a God, part of God's family, you have to love heaven more than you do the earth. You have to love the eternity, the eternal more than you do the temporary. That's what, that's what Jesus is saying. In other words, you have to love the new life more than the old one. You have to be more, more connected to heaven and God's will more than your own. That's what he's saying. Okay? Because if, if all it takes is a little issue to throw you off track, to, 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 to say, I'm not following Jesus anymore. He says, I'm not sure you ever did follow me in the first place. This is strong stuff, y'all. I know. I get it. I get it. But I want us to be a strong church full of strong believers, strong marriages, strong families, strong children. We want that together, right? Let's grow in this together. Let's grow in this together. So let me share this with you. Uh, I was looking up persecution today because in America, we don't get persecuted quite like the rest of the world. In North Korea, uh, they get persecuted. That's number one in persecution. Let me share, share with you some statistics or some things that are happening. Uh, every month, listen to me, every month, 250 Christians are killed. Every month. It's happening now. 104 are kidnapped, abducted. 180 Christian women are raped, sexually harassed, or forced into marriage. 66 churches today, or this month, in a, in a month, are attacked. 66. 160 Christians are detained without trial and imprisonment. According to the World Watch List, 215 million Christians experience high levels of persecution in countries on the World Watch List. This represents 1 in 12 Christians worldwide. Are persecuted. In 2018, the reporting period, this is the World Watch list. 3,066 Christians were killed in 2018 so far. 1,252 were abducted, 1,020 were raped and sexually harassed, and 793 churches were attacked this year so far. It's real. Now, we live so comfortable right now. Yeah, we have churches. That was persecution, what happened at the Tree of Life Synagogue. It just looks different here. You're being persecuted in different ways. You're being persecuted from the inside, from the inside of your mind. You're, you're being persecuted by demons. You're being persecuted by depression, by anxiety. It just looks different here. It, it's, it's more internal. It's more the way you think. It's more in the things that just lure you in uh, to, to convenience and to just, you're being, you're being persecuted in different ways. In other words, we're like that frog that's in the heat of water, comfortable, like, man, this water feels good. And it's being turned up little by little. Before you know it, we're cooked and we have no passion for God anymore. Without resistance, there is no strength. Without opposition, there's no opportunity. Right. Without being pressed down, there's no there's no if I don't if, if I'm just kind of like, yeah, I can lift weights like this all day. Right. I'll get tired for a little while, but I need to put some weight on this. And as Christians, I want you to think about about us. OK, I want you to think about, OK, if we're not persecuted. Does that mean that we're not following and that we're not the real deal in America? Because he said that it comes. If we're really following him and want to pursue a godly life, there will be persecution. If you haven't been persecuted, I'm just questioning. I'm like, dang, we live really good. We live well. We'll have a couple of trolls that come on social media and they don't like me. And I'm just like, Lord, should I curse them? No, the Bible says bless those who curse you. Okay, I'll bless them then. 
Can I pray against them, Lord? No, no, no. Bless those who curse you. But that's a troll. That's somebody who just wants to get on our nerves. So, so, so let, me, let me say this to you. We're on a journey to become more and more like Jesus. We're on a journey to be the real deal, not to be fake and phony, not to play church, not to be a convenient type Christian, uh, not to be a person that is so fickle, so weak-minded. It's just a person that shops for church like they shop for restaurants. Not, that's not the kind of people we're going to be. Hello. We're going to be the type of people that God says, that's my people, that's my family. These are the ones. These are sons and daughters of the whole, most high God, what the scripture is talking about. How many of y'all want that? How many of you want that? Okay. All right. So how do we prepare to deal with persecution? Because it's going to come. It's going to come. How do we prepare to deal with issues and problems and trials? How do we prepare for this? And the first thing that I want to say, and I got three points for you. The first one is this. You have to count the cost. That means you got to know what to expect from the very beginning. You have to count the cost. Now, um, every person has roots. And those roots are values, beliefs. Those roots have to do with your faith. And specifically about God. And some people have really weak roots. Really shallow roots. The Bible calls this rocky soil because your heart is rocky. Maybe you have some offenses and some, some things that need to be healed. And, and so something's off in your heart. So when the word comes, you have rocky soil. It doesn't get rooted in your heart. And so therefore, the word doesn't bear much fruit. Now, I've been listening to the word of God for years, reading it most of my life. And, and isn't it crazy how sometimes you come and, and you've been coming for months or years and then you're just like, okay, I've been receiving a lot, but my fruit is very little. Has anybody ever felt that way? Anybody? Okay, I need, I need to know because I want some identification. I want, to, I want to know that you know what that feels like where you're just like, why am I I'm reading about all of this? But my fruit doesn't match what I'm receiving. It's because of rocky soil. Scripture tells us this. In Matthew 13, 20, 21, let's read this. This is rocky soil. This is the parable of the different types of soil. There's the wayside soil. There's the rocky and thorny soil. But specifically the rocky soil is when we cannot get rooted or the word doesn't do its work in our hearts because our hearts are off. There's an issue there. Here's what it says. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Boy, that was good, man. That was a good word, Pastor. Boy, that hit me right there. I'm so pumped. But here's what happens. 21. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems. Man, my AC went out. What did I do, God? Why would you do this to me? Or, have, or are persecuted for believing God's word. As soon as things don't go your way, you turn away from God. That is rocky soil. As soon as things don't go your way, you turn away from God. It's rocky soil. But I want you to know that freedom is not free. It's been said that. I was in Washington, D.C. last week. My wife and I went on a pastor's trip along with other leaders that was sponsored by an organization called Movement here locally, but they're also all over the United States, and it was, it was amazing. And so we went to the World War II Memorial, and they have on this uh, monument there, uh, close to the Lincoln Memorial, they have these little stars that represent 100 soldiers that had given their life for my freedom. And it, it equaled over 400,000 soldiers that gave their life. Fathers, mothers, someone's child, someone's young adult that gave their life for my freedom. It was a surreal feeling. One of the pastors says, let's not just pass by this. Like, these people gave their lives. This is what it costs for us to be free. 
in all the wars that we've had in the USA, over 1.1 million people have died for my freedom. It cost a lot for me to be here. It cost a lot. And then if you look even further, World War II, over 80 million people lost their lives in World War II. It's crazy. And then I started thinking, we went to the Bible Museum, and then I saw that the Bible was, it, it took over, I used to say 1,500, but I learned that it took over 1,600 years to write the Bible. And then, and then I, I saw like little piles of burnt Bibles of the people that they burned their Bibles and they burnt them for reading the Bible. And I saw a pile of burnt Bibles there. And then I saw Bibles where there was one translator that as soon as he finished translating the Bible and as he was presenting the Bible, after that, he finished translating the Bible, uh, he was killed immediately after that. And all the stories of, of the people that lost their lives for the sake of Christ. And then I read the Bible of, of people that were sawed in half. They were stoned. Paul was, was, was left for dead more than once imprisoned and yet he was rejoicing and 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 found himself worthy of suffering for Jesus Christ like like he was just saying man I count myself worthy of suffering for him like I'll suffer for him there was some, such love in their hearts that they're willing to do this like they were they knew that there was a price to pay for following Jesus it wasn't convenient it wasn't just to raise your hand it wasn't just come to the altar it wasn't just an hour and a half that we do every week I mean if all we pay f- to, to follow him is coming here once once a week it if all we pay is 10 minutes a day to read a devotional, if that's the cost that we're paying, no wonder we don't value it. No wonder we don't value his ways, his word, because it's nothing to us, man. We have so many translations. The Bible is the most translated book in the world, in history. To over 2,000 translations of the Bible. The one that comes close to that is only 289 translations. It's a big gap. The word is so valuable, it's, it's, it's so life-giving, it's in our culture, it's in the world, it's impacted the world more than any other book, because it's alive. <laughs> we don't read it. Man, it convicted me to the core, because I'm like, man, we're not paying a price. We're not invested like we should be. We, we. I was convicted, man. I was convicted. So, Jesus was very clear that if you're going to follow me, you got to count the cost. It's going to cost you. you got to carry a cross. The cross is not, it's not light. It's heavy. But he carried it for you so that, so that you could carry your own cross. And what happens on a cross, y'all? Things die. Things die. I want you to read this with me. because I think this is powerful. In Luke, we're going to read Luke chapter 14. 25 through 33, it says, a large crowd was following Jesus. Now, Jesus wasn't into building a megachurch. He wasn't into having this just large crowd just to have a large crowd. He turned around and said to them. Now, this doesn't sound like he's, he's like, okay, I want to make things convenient for you. Uh, I want you to keep following me. So I'm going to make it as easy as possible for you to follow me. I'm going to make the temperature just right for you, for you to follow me. Everything's going to be what you want for you to follow me. That's not what he says. Look at what he says, the very next verse, 26. If you want to be my disciple, this is crazy. This is nuts. You must hate everyone else by comparison. You know what hate means? There's different translations. Hebrew is difficult to translate into English because one word means so many different things. It doesn't just mean what we read. That word hate means detest. That's why the scripture says don't hate your brother because you've committed murder in your heart. That's detest. But hate here means less than. You must love less than. You must, you must love them less than you love me. That's what he's saying. So he says you must hate everyone by comparison. Read this. Your father and mother, wife and children. Brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. You must love less all of this, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. That means my follower. That means my student. Now, how many of you feel like, dang, I think I love my child and my wife and my family, my mom and dad, and even myself more than I love him? 
Now, you can say it, but God really knows, right? Okay, so let's go to the next verse. Verse 27, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. God is basically saying, or Jesus is basically saying, you have to carry your cross. Like, are you serious? You're not willing to put your sin on the cross? Are you serious? You're not willing to put your bad attitude on the cross? Are you serious? You're not willing to put lust on the cross? Are you serious? Like, if if you're really serious, carry the cross and things should be dying as you follow me. Selfishness should be dying. Excuses should be dying. Apathy should be dying. Your will, your, your desire to, to make home here on earth should be dying. Like something should be changing as you follow me. You should be more and more like him as you follow. Why? Because you are dying to yourself. It feels like people, could, you can ask me, what does it feel like to follow Jesus? It feels like death. I feel like I'm dying to my own sinful nature every season of my life. It's almost like I want to basically go up to people and say, hey, man, how are you dying lately? (laughs) What's dying right now? You know what's dying for me? What's dying for me is, is the fact that I'm called to give everything away. What's dying for me is the fact that I want to self preserve. I want to hold on to stuff. That's what's dying. I want to plant churches. So, so me has to die so that that lives. Does it make sense? So I have this cross, and if you see me, yeah, I'm dying, y'all. I'm dying. And we should all be dying to the past, to selfish, sinful nature, always dying. It shouldn't be like we're living. Oh, man, I'm living. How, how are you? Man, I am really sinful right now. How's your spirit? Oh, my spirit is dying. Your spirit is dying, but your flesh is living. You're not carrying a cross. You're not carrying a cross. And so, I know this is heavy stuff. I get it. But, but, but know that we're all in this together, and we're going to do it together. Amen? Let's keep reading. Verse 28, it says this. But don't begin until you count. Oh, okay. He says, know the expectation. He says, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Have you ever seen a building that was halfway done and it's just left there for months? A foundation that nobody ever kept, you know, they just kind of were doing it by faith, but not God kind of faith. Let's go to the next verse. 29. Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. Jesus is using great illustrations so that they understand what he's saying. Verse, next verse. He says this in verse 30. They would say, there's a person who started that building that couldn't afford to finish it. And he wants you to finish strong. He wants you to start strong and finish strong. Let's go to verse 31. It says this. Or what king would go to war against another king without first uh, sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. Verse 32 says this, and if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Like he's giving them these turns. Like, like understand this. That's 43, I mean 33, uh, Luke 14, 33. Uh, so you cannot become, read this again, my disciples... Without what? Jesus is saying, count the cost. Well, what's the cost? Everything. That's why we're not experiencing the fruit. Because we're not giving up everything. If Jesus is Lord, that means he owns everything. And if he's your Lord, guess what he owns? Everything. He owns everything. The second thing that I want you to know to prepare for persecution and know that it's coming, how do you prepare yourself? You count the cost. The second thing you do is you understand that we can only overcome by way of the church. Would you say the church? 
which is really community. But the church is powerful because the church is the only institution that's the gateway to heaven. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And the church is his body. The church, his family, his people, the hope of glory inside the church. That's, that's, that's important because, see, if people are going to get to heaven or live as citizens of heaven on earth, if they're going to have eternal life, it's because of the church. And the Bible says this. Jesus said this about the church that's super powerful in Matthew 16, verse 18. He says, now I say to you that you are Peter, because Peter was a disciple and a follower that discovered this. He got this revelation from God. He says, and upon this rock I will build my church. And here's the powerful thing about the church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. He says, my church will be so strong that persecution can't stop it. My church will be so powerful because my spirit is within them that no problem will ever stop them. And it hasn't. That's why we're here today. Amen. Let's give God praise for the church. The church is a group of people that understand that we're better together. That if we're, we're going to overcome together. The church is a family that understands that, that my home is in heaven. That the reason why I must like you here is because I'm going to have to like you there. <laughs> Hello? You might as well get used to me. We're going to live forever. Right? So, so it's important because the church is the entity that God has chosen to prevail and to lean into the chaos. And, and it lives. And it's a powerful thing. I want to read this to you. Um, I want to read this to you. And I'm going to read fast for the sake of time. But I want to read... Um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, the whole, the, the, whole, the whole chapter. And what I'm going to ask you to do is, is to read for the Word of God. I'm not done preaching, but, I, but I, I am, I'm, I'm almost done because the time is running out. But I want you to read this whole chapter with me standing up, okay? Would you stand up? And I want us to read this together. Okay. All right. Now, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he's telling them we have a better way, a new way, which is the new covenant, which is the new promise that comes because Jesus Christ died for us. Jesus is, is the one who came to give us a new promise, okay, a new covenant. And here's what Paul says. I want you to read this with me. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, which is Jesus, we never give up. We reject all shameful and underhanded methods. And we don't try to trick anyone or distract or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God. And all who are honest know this. Let's read the next verse. Okay, I'm going to read it this way. If, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Those, those are the ones that, that don't understand. Verse 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Satan blinds their minds. Verse 5, you see... You don't go around preaching about ourselves. We don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. We, know, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great powers is from God, not from ourselves. Verse 8, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Verse 9, we are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. This is a great attitude. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Verse 11, yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Verse 12, so we live in the face of death. This is a result in eternal life for you. It's powerful. But we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God. 
So I speak, verse 14, we know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. Isn't that powerful? 15, all of this is for your benefit. It is. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. Verse 16, this is why we never give up. This is why, though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Isn't that powerful? The last point is this, that if we're going to overcome persecution or lean into it and continue to follow Jesus, we must understand that we are citizens of heaven. I want you to say that I am a citizen of heaven. It's important for us to realize that they used to say this place is not my home. I'm just a passing through. It's true. It's easy for us to make a home for ourselves and build a legacy. We need to do those things. I get it. And I think we need to rest and, and have some recreation and have some fun. I get it. But if that's all we do, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. We're citizens of heaven. I want to read a couple of scriptures and then we're, I'm closing this. Um, Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says this. It says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus is saying this. Verse 20. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Let me ask you this question. Is your heart in heaven? Is your treasure in heaven? If it's not, your heart's not going to be there. And your heart, what manifests what's in your heart are your desires. It's important. The promise that we receive in the very last book in the Bible, in Revelation, is powerful. Revelation chapter 12, verses uh, 12, actually, just verse 12. I'm sorry. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 4, says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse 3. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. That's his desire. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. Verse 4. I will wipe away. I will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's heaven. Now, I want you to think about this. Heaven is a country. It's a place. And it's eternal. That's where God's family is going to live forever. Now, do you want to go there? We have to live now as if we are already there. Does it make sense? If we can't live now as if we're citizens, it just means we don't really want to live there. Are you still here? So do you want to go there? Do you want to live forever? Okay, good. Now, I want you to think about who you want to go with you. Who do you want to go with you? You're thinking about your spouse. You're thinking about your friends. You're thinking about your kids, right? Are you inspiring them to go with you? 
Are you setting an example that says this person is so in love with God, so in love with Jesus, that even if things don't go their way, they don't give up, they don't turn away, they keep pressing on? Even if they get sick, they don't blame God. They understand that this is a fallen world, that the wages of sin is death, and the only reason we die in the first place is because of sin. These are people that don't blame God for everything, for every problem that they have, for every job that they lost. They don't blame God. They, they've grown up. They've matured. And this person inspired me. Why? Because they give everything to follow. They inspire me because they're unmovable, unshakable. They inspire me because there's passion when they speak of him, when they read of him. There's a, there's a light that comes from their heart. There, there's something about them that's different. There's a peace in the midst of a storm. They're calm. They're still. They, they know that, that, that God is with them regardless of what happens outside of them. They understand that their home is in eternity. They understand these people are different. These people follow at all costs. These people carry a cross. These people are different. These people love radically, unselfishly. They hope. They endure. They love like, like no other. They love each other. They forgive each other. They bless their enemies. They pray for the people that persecute them. They pray for the person that executed their spouse. I'm blessing the person that raped my wife. Those are the people. People have done that. It is it is, I'm telling you, people are losing everything to follow him. As, as I speak, families are being torn apart for the sake of Christ. As I speak, something bad is happening. As I speak, and someone's saying, God, I hope in you. Can we be that type of church that is not trying to look for the easy way out? We're counting the cost, we're a part of a church. And we understand that we're citizens of heaven. That I will set my mind on the things above and not on the things on the earth. And I won't be so preoccupied with the temporary that I forget about the eternal. But I'm going to remember that my home is in heaven. And I'm a citizen in heaven. I'm here to represent there. And Jesus, he came to the earth and God bankrupt heaven. So that we can eventually bankrupt the earth. And feel heaven. And occupy and invade heaven so that the earth wouldn't be full of people that are disobedient. No, but that heaven would be full of people that are obedient. Let's do this together. Amen. Let's lean into this. Can we grow some spiritual muscles together? Can we be a strong church? Amen. All right. Let's stand to our feet.